Good morning. Morning. Good morning. I'm going to read to you out of the book of Psalms. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all the people see his glory. Amen. Father, we thank you today for the privilege of coming into your presence, the freedom to gather together openly, to gather together without fear, to declare your praises, to read your word, Father, to have fellowship one with another in the light of your Son. I ask, Father, that you would be here today to meet and answer every need. You know the depths of our heart, the depths of our thinking, Father. I ask that each of us today would be connected to you in a new and a refreshing way that you might receive glory and honor and praise. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
in this time of desperation. But all you know is doubt and fear. There is only one foundation. We believe. Jesus. 
Let us truly believe that you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you and help us to diligently seek you, Father. We thank you for all of our visitors today, Lord. We thank you for the ability to get together and celebrate your victory, the redemption that you have for us. I thank you that you died for us while we were still an enemy of you, that you paid that price because you loved us even as an enemy. Now as children, let us glorify you in our life. Father, we pray for the children. We pray for the teachers of these children. Just instill sound doctrine into this next generation, Father. And we just lift your name on high and ask for blessings for our service. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <coughs> children are dismissed.
Yeah, they have snacks. <laughs> yeah, why don't we have snacks? Uh, Leslie, I know you do. You stash them in your purse. <laughs> Anybody that's in need of a snack, hit up Leslie. All right, if you have your Bibles, open to uh, Philippians chapter 3. We're not going to start yet, but I want to give you a head start. Okay? Philippians chapter 3. Um, the Most of the rest of the Cory clan is with
um, Frankie, how, how many times did you get to practice that song? Uh. <laughs> that was his first practice. Just so you know. Makes me sick. <laughs> thank you guys for sharing. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Ben, would you hit these likes, please? <laughs> All right, so we are in Philippians chapter 3. Um, we're kind of in a summary point. We're wrapping up this chapter. We'll be moving into chapter 4 quickly. Uh, chapter 4 is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, we're going to pick up in verse 12. No, actually, I'm going to go ahead and jump down to 17. Um, I can't do that. i got to go to 12. Uh, verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Boy, isn't there satisfaction in that? Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. Wow. You know that God is not expecting you to be perfect, right? Amen. Because he knows we can't be. Um, we work... As, as Peter writes in his gospel, increasingly, in increasing measure, adding to. Um, and I thank God that he doesn't require us to be perfect because I would be in deep trouble. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those who are mature think this way, and if anyone, uh, I'm sorry, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have obtained. Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many, of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, Walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and the, they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. All right, last week we, we kind of re recapped uh, the previous part of chapter 3. Uh, we talked about uh, in verse 15, let those of us who are mature, uh, we talked about the, the Greek word for mature is elios. It's the same root word that Jesus used on the cross when he said it is finished. Um, to be mature in Christ is what we should aspire to be. <clears throat> we are to spur one another on to love and good works. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been spurred, but my understanding from the reaction of the horses I've seen, it's not a pleasant experience. I think sometimes we need that. I think sometimes we need a good poke to get us moving, to get us off our derrieres and get us back into the game. Okay? Um, so if we are mature, we should have the same mind as Paul in this matter. And if you think otherwise, eh, God will teach you. Okay? Um, you know, it's funny to me when I listen to disagreements between Christians, and sometimes pretty, the, the disagreements can be pretty vehement. I think about the people involved. And I think about maturity. Now, I don't want to see any hands, but how many of you believe that you are mature Christians? And another, yes, sir. 
saying I am not telling you that there are uh, issues that, that we don't take a stand on that we are immovable in um, that's not what I'm saying in the non-essentials we need to have liberty okay um, there are a lot of non-essential issues that for some reason or another we insist on making essential and it's a complete and utter waste of time okay uh, we get so caught up in the minutia and the triviality of religion that we so often paste over Christianity that we miss the point of what being a Christian is all about. Okay? Uh, at its core, being a Christian is about relationship. Amen. It's not about right or wrong. It's not about do or don't. It's about relationship, growing relationship, growing in intimacy, growing in... Uh, the relationship that you have with your Heavenly Father. And you can't really do that very well without spending time with Him. Okay. Um, I would encourage you to be a mature Christian, you've got to be in the Word. Okay. And I'm not talking about you know the little snippets that you get in our daily bread or the verse a day that you get. Those are, those are good, they serve their purpose but their purpose is far shallower than getting into the meat of the Word, going deep into God's Word. And, and I, I get frustrated because people say, well, I, you know, I'm not a Bible scholar. The only thing preventing you from being a Bible scholar is you. Okay? There are resources out there. There are people out there that you can talk to. There is nothing that you should be afraid of in the Word except the possible condition that it might make you uncomfortable. Because you might read things in there that, that might chastise you, that might pull you up short, that might correct you. Okay? But ultimately, this is for who's good. Ours. Ours. It's not for God's good. God doesn't need it. It's for our sake. And why? Because he designed us. He knows how we are intended to operate. Right? Yes? yes. No? Yes. I mean... What God are you serving? Are, are you serving a creation of your mind? This, this genie in a bottle that you can rub the lamp three times and he pops out and grants your wish? Or are you serving the sovereign creator of all things? The God before whom every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. See, it doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not. That's, that's irrelevant in eternity. It's extremely relevant right now this side of the great white throne judgment but God is I, we can go into the little details we can go into the history we can go into the proofs the prophecies the fulfillments we can talk about all kinds of things but ultimately when it comes to faith when it comes to Christianity what God desires from us is trusting him believing him accepting that what he says is so is really so You know, the writer of Hebrews doesn't say without intelligence or without wisdom or without study. He says without faith, faith, it is impossible to please God. And then what does the last of that say? Somebody? Anybody? You have to believe and believe that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Look, God's not up there with a beat stick. You know, he really isn't. He's, he's not out to get you. What he wants is for you to learn to trust him, to have faith in him, to believe in him, to, to be able to put your life fully and wholly in his hands and trust that he's going to bring you through everything that you're going through. And I know some of you are going through some really difficult things. Okay? It's really easy to say, yeah, I have faith in God when things are going well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. but, uh, and it's a little harder when things aren't going well. You know, Especially in those quiet times where God is just letting you grow. He's letting the conditions of your environment stretch you and, and mold you and shape you. 
that's when we really, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where we have got to put our faith to the test. Okay? Anybody can claim to have faith when things are going well. It takes a person of faith to have things going well in the midst of chaos. Right? Okay, so let's go on a little bit further. Um, let those who are mature think this way, and if anything, in anything, you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. What does that mean? Let us hold true to what we have attained. What have, what have we attained? Eternal security. Well, I, I heard eternal security issue. Salvation. Salvation. Okay? But what does that mean? Eternal, eternal life with God. Sorry? Eternal life with God. Eternal life with God. Eternal Years security. We've been justified. Justified. Absolutely. Look, when you become a Christian, every good thing that God has for you is, is for you. And that, unfortunately, so many people, when they come to Christ, they get this false idea that, that the rest of their life is going to be a bed of roses. And they forget that in the midst of all those beautiful flowers, there's a lot of thorns. Okay? They also forget that in order for those roses to grow and look beautiful, there's a lot of fertilizer that needs to go in with the mix. And life sometimes is us dealing with thorns, and sometimes it's with us dealing with fertilizer. <laughs> Okay. God does not promise us an easy walk. And if you come into this faith expecting that it's going to be a breeze, you're going to be sadly mistaken. Because God is going to call you to hardship. He's going to call you to difficult things because he wants you to be different from the world. He doesn't want you to look like them anymore. He wants you to start reflecting to the world the very nature and the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Okay? But when you come to Christ, Paul, you know, we, we do baptism, and Paul talks about the significance of baptism because it really shows symbolically what is going on when we come to faith. Because we are crucifying the old man. We're putting to death that person that was there before Christ. And then we bury that person and they are resurrected anew to a new life, being a new person. Sometimes God does miraculous transformations when people come to faith where, where sins just fall off of them. I know so many people that were dealing with, with addiction issues, and, and drugs and alcohol and they came to faith and God took all of that away instantaneously. I know other people that have had to work at it. God doesn't promise you he's going to take it away easily. He promises he will walk with you through it. He has given us his spirit that resides in us, that seals us in him, that gives us everything that we need pertaining to this life and to godliness. Okay? So let's look down a little bit further. Hold true to what we have attained. Uh, if all you're looking for is, is happiness in this life, you have no understanding what salvation really is. Uh, 17, brothers, join in imitating me. Wow! Can you imagine the... Uh, doesn't that almost sound arrogant? Yeah. Hey, be like I am. Wow, I want to talk with Paul. I, I, I really, I just, I want to, what were you thinking? Explain this to me. Join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. The question I want to ask you today is, are you a good example? Do you represent God well? When people look at you, what do they see? Marie has a saying, and she's been throwing this in my face all day. Okay. She says that she is a mirror. And I hate it. Because she just throws right back at me whatever I give her. And harassing has lost a lot of its fun. <laughs> One of these days you'll have to ask me about a mushroom. Okay. Um, 
I think that is really the heart and soul of who a Christian is. <coughs> we are a mirror. We should be reflecting to the world the glory of Jesus Christ. Yeah, some of our mirrors have some bubbles. Some have some curves. Some of them may distort things a little bit because we're never going to be perfect. But I guarantee you, if you go into this thing intentionally, God will walk you through it. Okay? So, um, are you willing to be an example? Are you willing? Are you in a place where you can represent Christ so that others can look and follow your example? Or, are you looking for someone to follow as an example? That's a good thing. It's a good thing to have people that you can look up to in the faith, to have fathers and mothers in the faith, just as Apollos had, had uh, Aquila and Priscilla that taught him and instructed him. We, we need mothers and fathers in the faith. And quite honestly, if you've been a Christian for a while, you should be suited to be the father or mother of, of a baby-growing Christian. If you're not, something is wrong with your walk. Okay? And I, I am afraid that for so many Christians in the Western world, our walk is simply that of, 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 some, of uh, almost hedonism. <coughs> Look at my example. I have a new car. That, that's not me, by the way. <laughs> I still have my truck. Don't worry. Look at me. God is blessing me with uh, four jets. Or this, or that, or the other thing. Look. Um, I, we had a sign in our house, a, a little plaque on the wall that said that God wants uh, spiritual fruit, not religious nuts. <laughs> and I think that's a whole lot deeper than it sounds at first. Um, all too often, we confuse our relationship with God with religion. And if you look up the definition of religion, it's to bind yourself to a set of ideals. Okay, And that's not a problem in and of itself. If you have the right ideals. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what it comes down to is uh, we can't There are sins that are unique to each of us. Okay? Scripture says that anyone who knows the good that he ought to do and doesn't do it for him that is sin. Okay? Now, sin is sin is sin. Okay? That's, that's just it. But there are some sins that I am prone to, that I am weak in confronting. There are other sins that I shake my head and I think, why are you even struggling with that? That's ridiculous. That's not an issue. And, and you could look at my sins and go, Really? That? You struggle with that? Grow up. Please don't do that to me. <laughs> okay. um, but religion is insisting that everybody walk your path. Okay. And no, this is not one of those new age garbage things. Everybody's got their own walk up the mountain and they all arrive at the same place. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the race that God has called you to run. Your race might have more hurdles than my race. My race might have a lot of stumbling blocks. But we each are called by the Spirit of God to grow in the Spirit of God. And, and how God takes me to that place is not necessarily going to look like what, how he takes you to that place. Okay? Religion would be if I told you you have to go my way. And so, religion oftentimes leads to death. If, if you know, um, one of the greatest things that changed my walk, that changed my life in Christ, was when Kelly McCormick was talking, and he, he made the comment, if you could do nothing to earn your salvation, why do you think you could do anything to keep it? Because somehow, and, and I know this is specifically my issue, I know none of you probably deal with this, but somehow we come into this, this faith and we feel like if we're not good enough, that he'll reject us. We forget that he's already seen every failure that we will commit, every sin that we will commit. He has seen all of the evil 
in our thoughts, in our hearts, in our actions, and he still chose to love us. See, when, when we stumble in an area, it's not a surprise to God. God's not up there going, oh! <laughs> what do we do? God's not surprised. That's why when Jesus said, it is finished, that was the stamp. The transaction is concluded. There is nothing left owing on this debt. When Christ gave his blood for us and he gave his life for us, that debt is paid in full. The only thing that we have to do is to receive that receipt, to apply it to our lives. Okay? And then we start growing in him in increasing measure. The fruit should be more and more <coughs> abundant in our life. Um, we... we uh, we're down in Darby yesterday, and there were some berries on a tree, and being who I am, I took a berry off and I put it in my mouth. Um, I don't recommend that for most people. Um, I did that when we were in Denver, only to find out that the uh, little thing was toxic. Uh, um, but thankfully, I put it in my mouth, it was gross, and I spit it out. Um, but if your fruit tree does not bear fruit, there's an issue with your tree. There's an issue with the fertilizer. There's an issue with the watering. There's a, there, something is going wrong. Okay. Um, we all need to have fruit. Now, the, the danger that we have in this is comparing my fruit tree with your fruit tree. Okay. It's so easy to compare ourselves to people that are not as far along as we are, isn't it? And there's a danger in that. I mean, we get arrogant. I'm so glad that I won't deal with that. Jeepers, crime and Come on, grow up. But then if we turn and we compare ourselves to those that are further along, there's danger in that as well, isn't there? Who are we to compare ourselves to? Christ. Christ. Christ is the goal. Christ is what we aspire to. And we're never going to be perfect enough for that. And that should make us all the more celebrate His grace. His marvelous, wonderful grace. That he looks at us and he knows us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And still he loves us. Still he pours out his love into us. He, he renders his grace to us. He gives us his mercy. He is faithful when we are faithless. He still loves us. Keep your on those who have walked according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Now I believe right here, I don't think Paul is addressing those outside the church. I don't think he's addressing the unbelievers. I think right here he is talking about those inside the church. I think he's talking about those wolves that come in dressed up in sheep's clothing. I think he's talking about those people that Jesus warned us to be on our guard about. Okay? It's really easy to be on your guard about the world. They don't look anything like us anymore. Right? We changed. We have different motives. We have different objectives. But we get it here, and, and uh, I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. What is significant about the cross of Christ? We go back into Philippians, we see this idea kind of pop up here and there. You read any of Paul's writings, you will see that this, this is a common thread throughout all of his writings. When Paul was ministering here on the earth, he was beset by those in the new faith, the sect of Christians, the Nazarenes, who came in and they wanted to fuse the cross and the grace of Christ with the Mosaic Law. Now we still do this today, although not we don't kind of look at it the same. But once a person comes into faith, they come into the body of Christ, all too often the first thing that we want to do is clean up every part of their life. You gotta stop this, you gotta stop that, you gotta stop the other. And you know what? In place of that, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. <coughs> Sometimes we make being a Christian a bore. It's a drag. And it's not Christianity, it's religion. Okay? Read the book of Acts. Look through the Gospels. When people came to faith, it wasn't about, oh, dang it, I'm a 
Christian now. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> right? But how many churches do you go in and that's what you feel like? Yeah. When they came to Christ, what did they do? Rejoice. Man, they rejoiced. They partied. They were like, yeah! Right? I don't know how you guys did it. I didn't do the app thing. Um, actually, I think that's probably the only time in my life I've done that. Um, take a look at the fruit of the Spirit. And then overlay that in your life. Just, just do a comparison. Okay? Love. Do you have love in your life? Agape. Choosing to love regardless of whether or not the person is worthy. Joy. Scripture tells us that in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. Okay? The veil has been rent. The only thing that keeps us from being in the presence of the Lord is nothing. Wow. That was profound, wasn't it? We, we, David writes, where can I go to escape you? I, I can't. Everywhere I go, there you are. He goes before us, he follows behind us, <coughs> he walks beside us. Peace. Peace. Peace that the world can't give us. Peace that the world can't even understand. I think that's why when Christians go through hardship, that's, that's the best time for us to reflect Christ. Mm -hmm. Because we can have peace in the midst of it. Amen. Patience. Oh. <laughs> Some of my fruit is pretty scraggly. Okay. You know, others, I got a nice golden apple, and then some I got this little, I don't know what it is. Okay, so do you. <laughs> Patience. It's really easy to be patient when there's no one around you. you know? Kindness. Oh my gosh. That is one fruit that I wish more Christians would take to heart. <coughs> be kind. That doesn't mean to give way. It doesn't mean to be a wuss. It doesn't mean to be weak need. It, it means that in spite of being in a disagreement, you can do such with kindness. Speaking the truth in love, right? Faithfulness. Wow. Faithfulness. I, I don't think that's just to God. I don't think that means just faithfulness to God. I think that means faithfulness to the body of Christ. Faithfulness to the call that he has given you. Faithfulness to represent. Faithfulness. Gentleness. Wow. A soft answer turneth away wrath. And by the way, if you ever want to know where I've memorized scripture, if it's in King James, it's up to the age of 16. If it's the NIV, it's up to the age of 36. If it's ESV, it's after that. Okay? Um, to be gentle. Wow. So often in the church, we're not gentle. We, we, we can be harsh. We can be cruel, even. This is for your own good. Smack, 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 smack. <laughs> I think that's for your own good. I have to sing the song to catch my place. <laughs> Gentleness. Dang it, it's still there. Self-control. Not giving way to the flesh. Holding fast to the maturity that you have in Christ. Seeking to grow in maturity. Self-control. When that farmer pulls his tractor on the middle of the east side highway, and I want to blast the horn, and I want to zip around, well, I do kind of zip around him. But at all times being aware that you represent Christ. All times. Whether you're on Eastside Highway behind that farmer, that for some reason only drives around my house, <laughs> whether it be at work, in the midst of uh, people that may not be believers and, and have different motivations than you do, whether that be at home, that he, you know, uh, Will Rogers said that you need to treat your friends like family. 
but you also need to treat your family like friends. Sometimes the people that we are the most affected <coughs> to are those that are closest to us. Oh, I can just let my guard down and be myself. You know what? Yourself sucks. <laughs> right? If that's what yourself is, you need the cross. You've missed the point. You're not painted in the grace of Christ. But isn't that a sad thing that, that we often treat our family the worst? Right? Self-control. When somebody does something that you don't like, somebody sits down next to me and makes mouth noises while they're eating, <laughs> I have to exhibit self-control and not strangle them. <laughs> and try to carry on a conversation or just get up and leave. Self-control. This, this, these are the things that should be increasing in our lives. These things should be growing from day to day. As you look back over the course of your life, you should see growth in each of these areas. But don't look at, look at somebody that has more growth in a particular area. There's, there's a, a lady I know that is the most gentle lady I have ever met. She, wow, gentleness just exudes out of her. I will never be able to be as gentle as consistently as she is but I'm more gentle today than I was yesterday, I hope. I'm more kind today than I was last week, I hope. And that's, that's what I, my, my goal is, that is what I aspire to. Not so that people can look at me and go, oh wow, isn't he a great Christian? No, so they can look at Christ and go, wow, you have incredible power to change that jerk. <laughs> that you can take somebody like that and bring about that change in them, wow, there must be a God. Right? Right? You know, uh, St. Augustine said, preach always. If necessary, use words. Okay? That means that everything that we do, we're preaching. We're representing. We, we are, in whatever way, we are preaching the gospel of Christ. And if necessary, use words. If you come to somebody and you give them the gospel verbally, and they look at you like you've grown two heads, you probably haven't represented well up to that point. Right? Right? Now, I'm not saying you gotta be false. I'm not saying you gotta be the, you know, every day at, you know, 11.30 when it's lunch, you gotta pull out your Bible and you read your Bible and, and people talking about sports and you don't do sports because, you know, God doesn't do sports, unless, of course, it's the avalanche. Then he does. Um, but but it, I, I'm not talking about being fake. I'm talking about being real, being honest, being open. And, and in so doing, you've got to remember that, that Christ wants this such that when you open your mouth to speak, these good things come out of it. He doesn't want you to open your mouth and blaspheme. Okay? It makes you ugly. It makes you ugly. It makes Christianity ugly. It makes that what you represent appear to be ugly to people. And they've already got problems with it anyway. The enemy, the, the, the prince of the power of the air has deluded them, deceived them. They don't understand. When they look at us, they should see a difference. But it shouldn't be a difference like, I don't want any of that. Lord, no. It should be, wow. I want some of that. I, I, I want to have that peace in my life. I want to have that joy in my life. I need that. I wish I could love like that person loves. This is how we represent. Right? Shouldn't it be how we represent? Yes. Shouldn't that be our goal ultimately? You know, when Jesus gave the Great Commission, He said, go and preach the gospel to every living creature. What does that exclude? Who are we not supposed to preach to? Right? I mean, really, the people that we minister to the most are those closest to us, right? The oikos, yes. the family, the household. And, and oftentimes, that's where we minister the least, right? Right? I mean, I know that was my problem for a long time. Sometimes it still is my problem. But that's <laughs> You don't have to answer that, <laughs> but we will talk later. <laughs> I'm going to minister to you, okay? laying on of hands. <laughs> All right. Um, I want to summarize. I want to recap. Um, brothers, 
join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Just real quick, I want to touch on this. When Paul thinks about these people, those who would shipwreck the faith of others, he's not, he's, he's not getting angry, he's not getting mad, he's not getting vehement, he's not getting judgmental. Look at what his reaction is. Tears. Tears. Because he knows the condition of their soul. He hurts for them because he knows their loss. Okay. It's so easy to get mad at the world. They don't know any better. You look at the things going on in this world and you think, how could you even think that? That makes no sense. Two things are going on right now. And I think the second one is increasingly. First, they're deceived by the enemy. Yeah. That angel of light that comes in and, and makes things look good and, and makes things look appealing. And then only after you've got yourself caught do you realize that you've stepped into a bear trap. The second thing is that when they have turned themselves over, they have rejected Christ, they have rejected the gospel, God allows a delusion to come on them that they might receive the just reward for their sin. And I think this is we're going to see this more and more as time comes closer and closer to Christ's return. I think God's just going to give people over. He says, okay, you want it? There it is. Have it. Drink the whole cup, all the way down to the dregs. Finish it. So, you know, when, when we see this in the church, instead of getting mad, instead of talking and backstabbing and biting and devouring one another, this should move us to tears. We do defend. We defend the gospel. We defend our brothers and sisters in Christ. But when people are coming in, we need to understand that there is something at work inside of them that is not of God. They're lost. They're lost. And if you really appreciate the grace that God has given you in your life, then you would really be motivated to desire to long for that grace in their life. 